Father, we simply ask in these next few minutes that your spirit would take these words written, recorded for us by Matthew, and you'd help us to get inside them, to understand them, that you'd bring your revelation and your insight into what is going on back there, back then. And speak to us as followers of Jesus Christ, here and now. Equip us, Lord, so that we go from here in some way changed and transformed by your Spirit. Challenged, envisioned, and equipped to live like Jesus Christ, for Jesus Christ. So that we can make a difference to other people's lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. I don't, I don't watch too much telly, but um, I, I guess every now and then, if I can, I try and catch a bit of question time. Do you know, uh, question time sort of chaired immaculately by David Dimbleby, and uh, they always have a sort of politically balanced panel of four or five uh, spokespeople, and then it's just topics of the day, questions of the day, and um, you, you know, whatever it might be that, that is in on the news agenda. And you get the whole, what I quite like about it is that you, as you listen to all the different people from their different political backgrounds and persuasions, uh, or some apolitical, no, no, no particular sort of agenda, but just a viewpoint, and you hear them answer the diff- all the different answers to the questions, sometimes gets quite heated, quite feisty. And uh, you sit there and you think, yeah, it really helps to unpack what the issue is. I, I feel a slightly more healthy way than, than often how our political debate in the House of Commons is, is one side of the House and the other. It's, it's quite antagonistic in that sense. Or uh, often Joe and I will we'll sort of uh, get up and have breakfast and so on with the Today programme on Radio 4 in the background. I realise that's what slightly ages us. <laughs> listening to doddering, listening to play. But um, uh, of course, you know, if our children, if they were awake at that hour, they'd come down and sort of change it to Capital Radio 1 and there's sort of something blaring out. But what, you, what you've got there is John Humphreys. Uh, and he'll, again, there's not much time. And they'll often have two people either side of the debate. And very often, he'll frame the, the question, he'll say yes or no. You know, I haven't got much time, I'm so sorry. Yes or no? What's the answer to this question? And of course, being good politicians, there's no way they're going to answer yes or no. They'll find some way to wheel around. Well, is there? And I, if I'm honest, I often have a bit of, I sort of sympathise with the, with the politicians, being sort of interrogated by Humphreys, because very often it isn't a simple yes or no answer. Or in order to arrive at yes or no, there's a background, there's context you need to understand. And it strikes me that that often when we read the Gospels, Jesus is in that kind of, the, in the crossfire. He's, he's in the heat of the debate. Often it's a yes, no, that he's being presented it. Come on, Jesus, yes or no? And, and, you know, when I think about being like Jesus, one of the things, living like Jesus, being more like him, one of the things that I kind of challenge myself with is, could, could I rise above? The, the heat. Can, can, I, can I avoid being trapped by the yes or the no? Is there another way in which I can um, live, express, be, that, that radiates something of God's kingdom, God's priority, God's values in my, in my life? Here's, a, here's an example. This little instant here. The, uh, the key figure, I guess, in the story, he, he's, not, he's indirectly mentioned, but he looms over the story it's not, it's not the Pharisees or Jesus, they're, they're the kind of, they are the players in it. The, the person who looms over it is Caesar. Caesar is, is a title, the emperor. It's known as Caesar, it's one of those titles. And actually it, it kind of has annotations not just of, of, of uh, someone demanding full allegiance and full respect. Someone who has totalitarian authority. But Caesar, is, it, it also has connotations of worship. The, the cult of the emperor worship. And so he was not only to be honoured and obeyed, but worshipped. And the coins that um, are mentioned here that were used to pay the tax, that is the essence of the question that's put to Jesus here. The coins, all the, these Roman coins, they were like, they were more than just a currency, more than just a way you, you bartered. 
they were actually a sort of, um, they're almost like a sort of citizen's identity card. You know, all Roman citizens carried the coin because on the coin was the, as Jesus asked there, whose image? What inscription? Well, the image was Caesar. It was the head of Caesar imprinted on every single coin. And round the edge of the coin were the words uh, Divi Filius, son of God. The image of the emperor, the son of God or son of the gods. Implication. He, he is everything. He is everywhere. And you, you worship him. And as part of a little reminder that Caesar would put out, you pay him tax. You're in his power, in his thrall. You're under his authority and rule and reign. Loyal citizens of, of Rome carried the coin. And it's why devout Israelites didn't. Because of the second commandment, you will have no other God but me. You will create no craven image. You will make no idol. And so to carry a coin with someone purporting to be a god, no way. I'm not carrying that. I'm not breaking a commandment. It, it was, this was really contentious. And depending on who the rulers were in, uh, in the different regions under Caesar, you know, some were, well, a little bit more chilled than others. But Archelaus was the governor of Judah in these times. And he was hardcore. He made sure he got his taxes. In Jesus' childhood, uh, one of the sort of zealots, one of the rebels, if you like, freedom fighters, because the people of Israel didn't like to be under Roman occupation. And there were plenty who would love to see the Romans overthrown. And Judas of Galilee was one such. And he led a revolt of about 2,000 guys, 2,000 men, led a revolt against paying the tax to Caesar. And Archelaus, under Caesar's authority in that region, had all 2,000 executed. Now, typically, the Romans would give a little bit of freedom to, uh, to the kind of religious expression of the Israelites. They knew they were a religious people, and so they would, they would honor their Sabbath. But in this instance, and, and that meant uh, execute, public executions and so on, bodies and so on were taken down um, in time for the Sabbath. That's why, incidentally, in Jesus, do you remember when Jesus was, he was uh, the day before the Sabbath, and that's why they went around looking to break their legs, to, to hasten the death so that they could bring down the crosses. But in this instance, all 2,000 were kept up, the dead and the dying, hung up there as a reminder that paying tax to Caesar was not an option. Here comes the sun. I might as well, I might as well move center now. It's got me. <laughs> So it's a contentious issue. And so they come, verse 15. The Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him and let's use the tax to Caesar. Let's see, yes or no, Jesus. They sent some of their disciples along with the Herodians to trap him. And behind I'll come back to the significance of the Herodians in a minute. Behind the question, paying tax to Caesar, yes or no, behind that really is a, is a desire. It, it's, a, it's, a kind of, it's a passion. Because whoever you are, whether you're disciples of the Pharisees, whether you're Herodians, whether you're, as they mentioned in verse 23, the Sadducees, all these different factions within Israel, different sort of, if you like, m m political groupings or with different theological persuasions all under Israel. But the one thing you've got in common is you don't want Roman occupation. You don't want Caesar. I don't owe allegiance to Caesar. Caesar is a, an idol. God. When will we see the kingdom of God? When can we live freely for God? aches and longings that I'm, I'm imagining live in many of us from time to time. When, when will we see a nation, a world, free to live in the way that God ordained it to live, without the terror and the warfare and the greed and the suffering, without the brokenness and dislocation that we see day by day on our news screens? When will we see the kingdom of God? That was the longing then as it is now. The answer to that question, that longing, 
depended uh, within Israel. It depended on who you listened to. As I mentioned, the zealots, probably these disciples, a number of them, they, they want nothing to do with Roman rule. They long to see it overthrown. So Judas of Galilee would have been one such. Uh, Judas of Maccabees, another one. There were various revolts that were kind of suppressed by the, uh, the Roman Empire. Another response, if you can't overthrow them, well, is actually to say the whole thing is corrupt. The whole thing, or the whole of this land, Israel and Rome, and every, all the peoples are corrupt. It was the response of the Essenes. that We don't hear much of them in the New Testament because actually they weren't really around in the, in the kind of heat of debate and battle. They withdrew. The response of the Essenes was to actually to just yeah to withdraw. They lived in sort of caves and outposts that were kind of quite nomadic. We know of them through the Dead Sea Scrolls, which were found in these caves uh, in the middle of the last century, and um, that's how we know about this Essene community. They believed that actually the whole thing had been compromised, and so to withdraw to keep yourself pure, that the light had been sullied. We are the light of the world. God had promised through Abraham. So to keep ourselves as that light, we withdraw from the darkness. And there was a third response, if you like, to how are we going to see God's kingdom come? And it was the response of such as the Sadducees or the Herodians. These were people who believed the most expedient way to see your agenda through, as it were, God's agenda, was through assimilation, through, through compromise. There's, there's no point in trying to overthrow them. They're far too powerful. They'll just squash you, crucify you, execute you. There's no point in withdrawing because if... You've got to be in it to win it. So, so get in amongst it and, and be prepared to compromise. The Sadducees, the Herodians, I mean, the Herodians after um, Herod, one of the, one of the, the rulers, we'll, we support, we'll go with him. And so they would, they would work with the tax collectors. They would carry the coin. And here's this political coalition, probably some zealots and some Herodians, those who would compromise. Normally they would be in opposition, but they, they're in coalition here to try and trap Jesus. And you see, in essence, is this yes-no question. Do you pay tax to Caesar? So if he says, if he says yes, yeah, you pay tax to Caesar, then then the zealots, the Pharisees, the disciples have found, no way, he's sold out. He's compromised. He's, he's just brought in with, the, with Rome. There's no way that he is going to usher in an alternative kingdom rule. There's no way we're going to see a new kingdom established if he's brought in with Rome. That's if he says yes. But if he says no, the Herodians, you see the, you see the trap? The Herodians, they'll report him. Hey, you ought to know this guy. He says we shouldn't pay taxes. Rome are on him. And it's just, instead of 2,000 crosses, it's 2,001. Rome can find another cross. Rome can execute another discontent. Yes or no? Jesus' answer is so simple and yet profound. And isn't that how it always is with the Christian faith? In fact, over, over the years I've been a Christian, I've come to realize that that's not a bad litmus test for where I am in relation to God. Because my life, like your life, I, I, have, I go up and down, I go in and out. Funnily enough, I find sort of holidays, we, um, just for sort of school-age kids and that kind of thing, so we tend to take holiday around school holiday time, so I've had a bit of time out, time off, and I look forward to it, and I love it, and we've had a great holiday. Uh, but I, it, it, I get a little bit out of pattern, out of kilter, and I, it, in some ways I find that, if I'm honest, the vitality of my, my relationship with God suffers in some ways. And one of the ways in which I, I kind of know that to be true is things get kind of strangely complex. It, it, it isn't quite so sort of straightforward. It isn't quite so simple. I'm not saying it's easy. Living the Christian life is never easy. But one of the things about, about God expressed in Jesus by his Holy Spirit is that it is, it, when we're in line, it's simple. You think of the words, you think of prophetic words, think of when God speaks in the Bible. It's never a great big theological tome. It's normally things like, Fear not. 
I am with you. Go here. You'll be okay. That's quite simple, really. You just obey. Go into all the world. Make disciples of all nations. I will be with you to the end of the age. That's just a couple of sentences. You know, the stuff that we're meant to be busying ourselves with is really quite simple. And here, to this complex argument within a really compact, complex context of, of, of the, sort of, all the sort of political machinations and the history. And then you can imagine as they ask that question, you could hear a pin drop around Jesus. What's he going to say? What's he going to say? So simple. Give me a coin. They give them a coin. By the way, even that's significant. I'll come on to that in a minute. He says, whose image do you see on the coin? They say, Caesar. Well, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. But give to God what belongs to God. Now the first bit of that statement isn't remarkable. But we read, according to Matthew's Gospel here, verse 22, when they heard this, they were amazed. They were amazed. It was the second half that amazed them. Giving to Caesar what was Caesar's is what everyone had to do. Nothing amazing about that. But in that context, give to God what is God's. The notion that was new, brand new, I mean like a grenade going off in that context, in that structure, was that not everything belonged to Caesar. Caesar didn't think that. He thought that everything belonged to him. And Jesus is simply teaching that certain things belong to Caesar. If a coin's got his head on it and he wants it, give it to him. But there are certain things that do not belong to Caesar. There are certain things that belong only to God. Human value and identity and being do not belong to Caesar. Try as he might, Caesar cannot control your thoughts. He cannot shape your heart. He has not given you abilities and passions and beliefs. There is a freedom of conscience that does not belong to Caesar. So Jesus says, give to Caesar whatever Caesar wants because there are certain things that he cannot have that do not belong to him this is so liberating some people have argued that in this little episode here and in that little answer Jesus is the first to distinguish between church and state because up until then the Caesars, the emperors, they knew no differentiation church was state It's just what the emperor says. You do. (laughs) And Jesus says no. The kingdom of Rome is not the same as the kingdom of heaven. And I have come to teach and to speak in and to initiate and enact the kingdom of God in Rome. How freeing. It's the birth of true freedom. You see, there's a difference between giving to Caesar because there's no option and giving to Caesar when there is a choice. The first is coercion. The second is freedom. And Jesus doesn't go into any of the camps. He doesn't polarize. He doesn't say, yeah, don't give it to Caesar. He says, well, if if it belongs to Caesar and Caesar wants it, yeah, you're free to give to Caesar because there's an even greater freedom by which to live your life. There are freedoms. There are elements of of what it is to be truly human and to live a truly human life that Caesar has no control over. And I have come that you may have that life 
and have it in all its fullness. Caesar, uh, Jesus wants Caesar to flourish. He wants Rome to flourish under the rule of God. That was the original promise through Abraham, that you, Abraham, and your seed, Israel, your people, will be a light to the Gentiles, to everyone, that all nations will be blessed, not just will bless you and will bless you, but you're not in. No, everyone is in, through Israel, everyone to be blessed. Jesus wants the flourishing of our enemies. He taught us such. He says, if you, know, if, you carry, if you carry someone's bags one mile, offer to carry them another. Again, we think, oh, that's just a sort of nice, polite little act. No, in, in Roman times, in occupied, when, when uh, the, uh, a Roman citizen, a Roman army particularly, were marching through an occupied territory, if they saw a native of the territory, they could make you carry their equipment, their bags. They'd be marching, they would you know, need to save their energy, and they just wanted to exert their power and authority. So you carry my bags for a mile. That was the kind of, you know, the sort of unwritten rule. So it was much resented to have to carry these heavy bags for your occupiers. And Jesus says, go another mile. How? I don't want to. I hate them. Yeah, because there are certain things that don't belong to them. There are certain spheres where they don't have any power. So bless them. Help them. Because there's a greater source of blessing. There's a greater source of power that you can live by. I, I, I love how Jesus lives. I love how he can just, in the midst of such conflict and such tension, he can just rise above it and yet be very much in it. The, the zealots and the Pharisees, they come to him and the Essenes knew all about him and the, the Sadducees, they come to him and the Herodians, all these different factions, they want a piece of Jesus, but he isn't any of them and yet he's amongst them all. He will have severely ticked off the, the zealots when he said, do you remember the Roman centurion? Do you remember the zealots of Israel, Israel went on in Rome? And Jesus says to the Roman centurion who comes in, look, will you heal my son? I believe you can heal my son. And Jesus says to him, truly, I haven't seen as great a faith in all of Israel as in you, a Roman. You think the zealots are like, oh, there's Jesus, he completely sold out. What about the Essenes? He's touching lepers, the unclean. He's talking to prostitutes. He's eating with sinners. He's going into Gentile country. Contamination. The Essenes, whoa. What about the Sadducees? It, it's all in the detail. Verse 19. You know this whole thing about the coin and the do we pay tax to Caesar? Verse 19. Show me the coin used for paying the tax. In other words, I haven't got a coin. I'm not carrying a coin of Rome. So someone had to go and get a coin for him. Isn't that interesting that amongst those around, someone was carrying a coin. And so they bring it to him. He's not a Sadducee. He's not compromising. He's not assimilating. Instead, he's speaking of a truer truth and a freer freedom than they have ever known. That's why Paul, leading the early church, could say, pray for those in authority. And Paul knew full well that meant praying for Caesar and for his leaders and the, the leaders of the regions, those who would eventually have him, a Roman citizen, executed. That's why Tertullian records, the early church historian, that the early Christian martyrs, they sang as they were transported to their death to be fed to the lions or the gladiator pit, they sang. Why? How? They, they knew they were going to their death and they sang, they rejoiced. Because they knew what it would, might be worth, I suggest. I don't want to get too political, but we could do with all remembering that, that all of us are migrants. I, this isn't our home. They knew that this wasn't their, Caesar could take their houses and their possessions, but he couldn't take their home. It didn't belong to their heaven was their home and that's where they were going. Caesar could kill them but he couldn't take their life. There's a greater freedom. There's a more real life that they knew and had tasted and experienced. And Jesus helped them to see that. Give to Caesar. If you, yeah, you, you want my life here on earth, Caesar? Here it is. You're not going to take eternal life. It's not yours to take. And that's being given to be by my saviour.
Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the writer to the Hebrews says, who is the author and perfecter of our faith. He's writing your life story and mine. He's perfecting your life story and mine. He's leading you and me into a greater truth, a greater freedom that transcends any truth or freedom that the world and all its Caesars would try to offer us. And as we fix our eyes on Jesus, he will help us with the issues of the day. We've all, as Pat was praying earlier, we've all been touched by that harrowing picture of uh, little Aileen, is it a little boy, washed up on a Turkish beach and you just, how can your heart, you're not human if your heart hasn't in some way been touched by that, notwithstanding the whole media thing and uh, you know, you can stir, all sorts of things get stirred up and there's debate on one side and the other, yeah, 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 Caesars all having their say. Many of the Caesars have valid points to make, but what is God saying? You know, there is, there is an issue of the heart and of a conscience that goes beyond whatever land you may be in, whatever border you may be in, whatever color of your skin, or whatever language you speak, whatever your background. I'm with the Archbishop of Canterbury. No one chooses to be a refugee. No one thinks, I'll walk for days and days without food or water, tired and hungry, with an uncertain future, no guarantee of where I'll end up, facing death. No one chooses to do that. And, and this passage, if we extrapolate and expand it and apply it to the, the, the tense issue of today, frees us to say, let's listen to Caesar, let's give to Caesar what is Caesar's, but let's also give to God what is God's, the value of human life. That I don't own, in one sense, my property. My, we, we're aliens and strangers, the New Testament says. Do I have a right to say who can and can't be part of what I have and where I am. Then maybe within the church, we're, the, the, there's going to be an intensification in this next sort of, you know, season next year or so on the on the sort of issues of human sexuality, uh, uh, just just this sort of inconsistent the instance, inconsistency at the moment with the, the, the legally there's gay marriage, there's the law of the land, and the, and the church is sort of slightly in dislocation with this. And we can talk about that. There'll be. There'll be liberal pro-gay and there's sort of evangelical anti-gay, but then there's also accepting evangelicals. There's all the Essenes and the Zealots and the Pharisees and the Sadducees. There's every kind of hue. And I think, Lord, I don't want to be boxed into any one of those things. I just, what is on your heart for the way we live our lives? Have we made sex a God? Discuss. That's the next question. Yes or no? That's for another sermon. Or a life group discussion, or a chat over a beer, I don't know. But Lord, I, I, don't want to get, I don't want to get sucked into these little grooves. I just, Lord Jesus, I, I want your heart. I'd love to be able to transcend all these issues, the political ones and the human ones and the social ones and the economic ones, to live life in the freedom and the truth and the power and the authority that people all around are amazed. Not at me or us, but at you, Lord. They're amazed at what these ordinary men and women can do and say and how they can live their lives. You up for that? As we journey together as a church, we, we, we gather here in Parsons Green. We're privileged just to have this building and this place. And we see, as we're, we're privileged to be here, we see all around needs and opportunities to live the Jesus way, to live like he lived and to love like he loved. And uh, we'll unpack a little bit more about that in the next few weeks and over this coming term. Things like the Rugby World Cup, it'll be fun, a great event. You know, I'm really looking forward to it. I'm really looking forward to the World Cup. I love all that, the hog roast and stuff. But it's just a vehicle to enable as many people as possible to encounter something of Jesus in and through it. There'll be all sorts of opportunities to invite in all sorts of ways. Our remembrance services, our Christmas services, harvest, all sorts of ways in which people can gather here. So many ways in which we can go out and be salt and light, true truth, real reality in a world that's sort of in abeyance to Caesar's. Give to Caesar that which is Caesar's. 
But let's determine and work out, challenge ourselves with what it means to give to God what is God's. Amen. Amen. Why don't we stand together? Pat, come and join me. I'd love, uh, it's great to have Luke back with us.